practical question from Hugh. He's had to go. Yep, okay. uh, he he's reminded um, that you did a presentation in Sri Lanka on the neurocognitive science and why the Buddha should be considered the first neurocognitive scientist. And he wonders if you might be able to share that. He remembers it as being really good. I emphasized the six, uh, the six parts of the dependent origination that we use in order to see clearly the pieces that have to be identified, which is the difference between feeling and emotion, okay? But also, this particular, at that time, at that time, the only research I was biting on, I, that I was basing the whole thing on, was there was a research um, project by three guys, I think, uh, up in Northeast of the United States. They, they did their research only based on um, one thing and, and she came, and then this woman who was a psychologist read their research and she came rushing back and she said, but wait a minute, or you, you, let's run the research again and not just base it on the smile. I think it was something to do with the smile, not just base it on the smile, but let's prove that you could change a behavior pattern. Now from this research, just the early Brack, early research, okay, that was in, this was in 2012, okay? Then after that comes the birth of neuroplasticity and neuroplasticity trickles in, but they probably got tripped off by these little things that these other people did underneath to get to the point of neuro, having a neurologist go and say, well, let's take another look at what's happening to the neural pathways in the brain when this guy's angry, okay? and and then um, we we can we see a difference? And what they found was in conjunction, if I'm not mistaken, the neuroplasticity happened on the development line for the MRIs. The FRMI happened, okay? And the FRMI, you can do more often than the MRI, okay? And they use this for examining behavioral modification techniques, you see? Okay, and... This all developed simultaneously with the new set of cameras that came into the MRI field. And all of a sudden they could see so much more in the brain. They could see the little strands. It wasn't just a picture of all these things looking like this and connected like crosswise pieces like this. All of a sudden you could see like little tiny hairs sticking up from the brain. And you know what? That guy who was angry, he had a thick one sticking up instead of a thin hair-like one. And that was his anger pathway. And she maintained that you could change it. We had to look and see if you could change it. And that's where you do have the potential to change a new, a neural, a, a new neural development of new neural pathways in the brain was real. So what's the big deal about all this was the fact that even 28 years ago, now if I count backwards, I think 30 years maybe, no one accepted that these uh, things could change once you were an adult, you were fixed in time. Even psychiatrists were basing this on these things can't change, the person is damaged and they're gonna stay that way, they can never change. So to me, after working in advocacy and mental health, I was there like, oh my God, you're saying there's hope. So this whole discovery of the idea that neural pathways are not locked in place, that if he was, changing to loving kindness every day and going to loving kindness and compassion every day again 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 his anger pathway if he did that instead of the anger would dry up and crack and fall off this was her theory so then they went two months and took pictures two months later and then they saw that the neural pathway was all shriveled up and dried out and then they saw this new tiny little hair starting to grow thing that was a new pathway of that's the hope highway. <laughs> That's what I called it, the hope highway. So to me, it was like having tears in my eyes to think the people that I had worked with before believed they were caught in these labeled situations of behavior. Now, how far can we go with this? Nobody knows, okay, yet, but they will. 
and the interesting part is, can it go as far as a bipolar disorder that's a one to five, say, can it flip away and just disappear if the bipolar disorder was set off by erratic uh, uh, trauma or um, you know, sudden trauma? From, we know from 18 years old, I think it is 18 years old and older, that when this hits suddenly, okay, like it did with me, it hit it su suddenly. And I was labeled at first bipolar, which was a very tragic thing because you can't change your hospital records. <laughs> and then I re reduced to cyclothymia afterwards, which is between zero and one, which is non-descriptive and not dangerous, you see. But I was in the one to five bracket, like one or two at first. Six people died in 10 months time. I couldn't handle it. I collapsed. I folded up. Uh, on the exit interview, all I can tell you about on the exit interview from the hospital after 28 days, you know, of going out of the hospital, I can remember the discussion with him. I, I, only one question. Do you want to tell me what happened? <laughs> so I asked him in the end. And I love Dr. Fisher. He was great. I was blessed by gods or whatever that this man was my psychiatrist at the time. And, you know, he looked at me and he went like this and he said, okay, you're in a house and you just threw the breaker switch off for the whole entire thing. That's what happened to you. And it was, that's what happened to me. And when I woke up the next morning, when I, I drove there and parked in the driveway and checked myself in, <laughs> it was very funny. And the next morning I wake up and the nurse says, I have to get up and walk to get breakfast. I said, I can't, I don't think I wanna sleep the rest of the day. They let me sleep the rest of the day, okay? but. When I got up to walk the first time, I couldn't. The walking wasn't there very well. I could use the banisters in the hallway to get to the room and cross the hall with a nurse and sit down to eat and go back to my room. That was the universe at that point in the beginning. It was a complete, utter collapse. And the way to describe this to someone, very difficult for you to understand. You're looking at color and you see color in a painting. For me, I didn't see any color in the painting for 38 days. Then suddenly I started to see color again. And for many years, I thought I was insane and someone in a, in a support group was talking and then they all agreed they had only seen grays and tans and browns and light blacks and different colored blacks, no color at all. I remember, I remember when I look back during the first um, 20 days, I got to go on the bus once to the mall and walk around with another person. I didn't want to be around people at all, not at all. And when I went, I came back and they gave me a very high grade. <laughs> I said, what's this grade for? It's a very high grade because I bought the brightest pink bedroom slippers I could find. That was it. Really bright pink bedroom slippers that you just slip on, these real cheap ones, you know, and they thought that was miraculous. When I went back to my house, uh, after when I went back to where I was living, okay, I looked in the closet and I realized he's right. I really did go off the deep end. I had discarded every piece of color out of my closet. There was nothing but grays and browns and blacks and dark blues in my closet, solid colors, no, nothing, no patterns at all. So I took all my clothes, I threw them out and went to the Goodwill shop and bought new clothes, as much color as I could find. But it took a long time to come back out of that situation. And, but where I came back out of that situation, how did I come back out of a situation? was by uh, making a decision to help other people understand that this can happen to anyone, you see? And then suddenly what happened, this is probably the next book, it should be, <laughs> you know, probably what happened was this man from the, um, the TV station, he came to talk to me because I was working with helping other people with depressive disorders at that point. And he said, what makes you do this work? I had to pause. And then I went and got him some coffee and brought it back. And I said, I think I'm doing it because when I'm doing this, I don't have any thoughts at all about my problems. None whatsoever. My world is gone and I can help other people. It's an incredible relief to come back and to be able to work with other people 
you know, just to have had the experience of going through that system like that, there is more to the story than that. But, but the whole thing was what really happened is that you are completely turned off. You can't fathom it. And then you get to throw one switch back on and maybe another. To top, top the whole thing off, it was not all a pleasant ride in the hospital, okay? Because they gave me a drug. They were supposed to monitor me very closely. I had a really bad reaction, caused a stroke in 24 hours. I got the stroke when I was sleeping. It took me two and a half years to prove that the stroke had happened. And eventually they came out with testing that they can give you now that can I can uh, bring out whether the person ever had a stroke. This testing, it's like eight hours long. It's just terrible. But you can do this form of testing now. But that wasn't developed at that point, you see. And those nurses just used to sit down there at that nurse's wing and just party and just party like crazy and never pay any attention to any of us in the rooms, you see. And I didn't know what happened. The next morning I got up, I could barely speak. And then I had to crawl all the way back from this whole thing. Uh, my walking wasn't damaged, but my brain was just not there. And I had to learn a lot of things again. That's what made me make the decision uh, in watching how some of the different ways that people were treated award by the different sets of psychiatrists is what made me want to do advocacy work. I didn't plan on doing advocacy work, but I was withdrawn when it came out. Totally withdrawn. You, you guys meet me out again. <laughs> but I'm, I'm understanding what happened now. They never told me for years. No one ever touched the subjects that we're talking about. So this whole thing about why get involved with it and how it was put out that he was the father of the whole thing. He's the only one that ever has anything out there that I know of that could explain to a person what happened to me. And by learning dependent origination, I understood totally and completely what happened to me. And then the, the part that the Buddha makes very clear in 128, if you go to 128 in the last paragraph, he makes it clear that all of the things that he discussed with those monks, the one solution for everything, every one of them, I understood that the, let's just say that the distraction or the, um, the hindrance is an imperfection of the mind. And I abandoned the imperfection. I abandoned whatever it was, the imperfection of the mind. That's how we got free of it. Okay. In right effort, he emphasizes again how you, um, you replace it with what you need to have in order to change. You can't change without that. So what she was going to um, do this big profound talk on at the time that I did that, uh, proving that he was the father of neuro uh, the um i would say cognitive psychology but not really neurocognitive science but it led to the neurocognitive science the trail the path of this whole thing is cognitive psychology and then neurocognitive uh, neurocognitive science and and neuroscience taking off and the projection for this whole thing is psychology departments will disappear on campuses and fall under the neuro, uh, neurocognitive science or neuroscience department and neurocognitive psychology will sit within it that eventually neurocognitive psychology will overtake the psychiatry and psychology. That's the projection for, for um, you know, uh, psychoanalysts and for psychologists. For the, for the psychiatrists, they're going through a medical, I don't know whether they'll, they'll, they'll or they'll stay separate. I don't know what they'll do. <laughs> I don't know. Because the, pro the problem, quite frankly, the problem with the psychiatry end of it, the psychiatrist can, can, ish can prescribe the drugs, okay? And the problem in our country is the drug, the drug system has overtaken the medical schools now. And so the doctors who go through the medical schools don't get diagnostics. You think they don't have Ayurvedic or homeopathic or naturopathic or anything like that, 
they don't have anything anymore except the physician's desk reference on their desk. So that book is like is like this book for Majima Nikaya and another one about this wide sitting on top of it. And the two years they used to have in diagnostics has been reduced to maybe six months to a year of learning how to read that book and it's set up symptom, drug, symptom, drug, symptom, drug. And if we don't have a drug for a symptom, let's invent one and sell it to you. And if at all possibility, unfortunately, if there's any possibility of it, we'd like to emphasize you get them on the ones that can stay on for life. Don't let them investigate anything else. Get them on the one that can stay on for life. Now, this is a bad trip, okay? Because in mental health, there's a group of stabilization drugs that you get at the front door and you have to have those drugs. You can't fight against those. This is a big issue. You have to have those when something initially happens to stabilize you enough to be able to hear and compute and understand if someone were to teach you what I was teaching you or anything else. You have to be able to do that, okay? It's, it's the drugs like giving lithium to someone to stabilize the ups and downs, but never checking in on them every six weeks or whatever it is for the blood test to be done. And the doctors don't do that. Then we can get in real trouble here because lithium, which works so well for a period of time, was, was working to take it, it when you have, apparently when you have a really traumatic thing happen, the lithium productive system goes and it doesn't wake up again. But many of those uh, consumers are never told the lithium was being produced in their body originally. There is a chance it can come back. In my case, I was very lucky. It came back, it turned back on. Because I maintained you can't label me that way. My argument was you can't label me that way without knowing who I am, first of all. Now, I was there, remember, 28 days. The average person is in there now four to five days and kicked out of the hospital. So the recidivism of coming back and in and out and in and out starts almost immediately. Why? Because it takes two weeks average time to adjust to a drug intake and know whether it's going to work for a person or not. So if you send the person home, how do you keep track of everybody? This is a, very, a really tough situation. And how serious is this whole thing in mental health? Well, it's as serious as cancer and heart disease. That's how serious it is. And how impressive should it be for the governments? Well, if, you, if I were to tell you the percentages you're losing on the gross national product due to mental health, you would just be aghast. And now with COVID, it's a, a tremendous, tremendous thing that everybody's up against. I only, I don't want to know a lot about it anymore, you know, but I peeked at some of the statistics at home and the suicide rates are not just up for young people. They're all over, over the sky into the firmament with the young people. But the older people who have been locked up and not even allowed to see their families, it's the biggest tragedy in the world's history as far as mental health is concerned that I can, I can even fathom. This is worse than post-World War II. That's what someone told me, worse. Because it encompasses all these different countries with all these different levels of development and how much cooperation we have is very limited. How much are you actually communicating with each other? It's, it's, it's just devastating. But for me back then, the secret for me to crawl out from under the floor with the whole thing when I came around, two things. One is the Native Americans. <laughs> The medicine man of one of the tribes offered to let me sit in his hut and paste together the things he had cut out that he's going to show for close to about two months time. And I was isolated in the cabin living by myself and doing this, listening to him tell me about life and tell me about people and how everything works and getting me to talk about very few things. But letting me do things with my hands. I wanted to do things with my hands all the time. When I feel my heart hurts when I come to a country who might not have a lot of places for people with, with mental breakdowns to go in order to work with their hands 
doing simple things to come back to the world. It's a shortage here, I think, you know? The four steps of right effort, if I had known them when I was 16 years old, and just the four steps of right effort, ah, my whole life could have been better. But no one would offer me that. You sit and pray and ask God to fix it. And if you have a question about death and dying, you ask the minister and he tells you, you came from dust and you're going back to dust and that's that. But there was nothing else to tell me. And I'm there, look, I can handle that with one person, maybe the second, maybe the third. But when you go up to like six or eight people and they're all just dropping like flies and some in painful ways, some very quickly, but in tragedies and trauma and everything, I can take it. I just couldn't take it. I don't think anybody should have to take it. I think that the four steps of right striving and right effort need to come out of Buddhism and go into all psychology in every high school before college. They need to be mandatory in health class. I have no excuse for ignoring the brain. I would like very much to get a hold of the books that are being used in high schools in the United States today and see what they learn in health class. If I didn't faint out of shock because I didn't know all the letters and abbreviations for everything, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know, a lot of things I don't know. Um, but um, basically, they tell you about your stomach and about your heart and about your breasts and about puberty and this and that and the other. Why don't they tell you about your head? Why don't they tell you anything? Why is it that we just exist from here down? Why? <laughs> you know? Like, here I go, I'm going to do, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to talk to you like this from now on because I'm not here. I don't exist. <laughs> Can you imagine? This doesn't, and yet everything is here at the control room. Do you, look, watch, if I pull this up, oops, I can't catch it. There's a little window under here. You can look inside. You see those guys inside? I should paint them. Over. They're all running the controls of your body and everything else. They're inside your brain. And it all starts here. So why aren't we talking about it? That's the point.